about the science of shadows. <coughs> Pardon? Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, turn with me, if you would, to Colossians chapter 2. We'll start there. We're going to look at several different scriptures that deal with shadows. <coughs> Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to read verse uh, 16 and 17. <coughs> Um, let no man therefore judge you in food or in drink or in respect of a feast day or of the new moon or of a Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is Christ. <clears throat> All right. So here they are talking about shadows. <clears throat> Paul is talking about shadows. And he is giving the example of food and drink, especially in respect to a feast day, and then feast days and new moon and Sabbath, and all of these things were uh, rituals, were uh, part of the worship of Israel. And um, the apostle is basically stating that the things that we were so familiar, the things that were such a part of your life as a Jew, the things that were handed down from generation to generation, the things that were um, how you worshiped God, all of those things are a shadow, a shadow of something greater. And if you, and you, you know, so let's talk a little, just a short bit right here about the science of shadows. I, I had a flashlight on the stairs and I left it when I left the house, so I didn't bring it. But if I had my hand here and I shined a flashlight onto my hand, it would cast a shadow on this board. You know, it's not, it's not as good as if you had a real, the light really shining on it. Yeah, let me try that. You know, I should have just grabbed my phone. There. All right. And from, from the shadow, you can actually gain the basic, you get a sense of the basic, um, get a sense of the basic form, but no matter how much the form identifies the object, even if it was better than what a shadow normally is, it, the shadow is still not the form, the real, the object. It's a shadow. It's not the object. It is casting an outline of it. It is giving you a form of godliness, or it's giving you a form of reality, but it is not the reality. Okay? That's one of the first things that you have to realize is that everything that the New Testament talks about was a shadow, which is pretty much all of the religious worship of Israel, it was only a shadow. It was not the substance. It was not the object that it was all about. All right. This is, this is describing certain feasts and certain, and, and you know, I mean, in a certain sense, you can go to any ritual. I mean, there are a lot of people that are Christians that do rituals. They think that you have to kneel a certain way and you have to do this and you have to do it that way. And you have to, you know, there are people who say, well, I have to get up and um, I have to have uh, my devotional time or whatever. Um, 
And if they don't have it, they feel like they failed God. Well, you know, your devotional time isn't Christ either. It may be you trying to get with Christ, but don't make an idol out of your religion. Religion can't save you. Jesus says, doing things for God is not God. <laughs> you know, doing things by Christ is better than doing things for Christ. Because you do it by the life of Christ, then it glorifies the Father because it is Christ. But don't mix up the shadow or the reflection of it or the religious act of it with the object himself. In this case, in this particular scripture, while it is using all these different things that Israel did for God that God prescribed for them, it says in this case that the real thing is, is Christ and his body. Now, that's incredibly powerful, and I won't go back into my teaching on the tabernacle, but I will tell you this. Uh, I teach the tabernacle and sacrifices and all of the things that are, that are in the Old Testament completely different than most teachers do it, completely different. Because what they do is they go to the shadow and they try to show you Christ in the shadow. That's like, take, that's like skipping over the hand and looking at the shadow to, f to figure out how that sort of looks like Christ. Does that make sense to anybody? That, I mean, it that's what they do. They're not, you know, they're not going to the object to just know the object. They're studying the shadow of it. Now, my belief is, and I think I've seen this clear enough in the scriptures, and that is, that the fulfillment of that shadow was not just Jesus 2,000 years ago, but is Jesus in his body even today. And, I, and, and those of you who are in my class know that that's the approach I took, and that that, that reality, and Paul deals with it over and over and over, and shows that we are, by oneness with Christ, the fulfillment of those things, but we're studying those shadows over there, to find out how that's Christ instead of being the reality of that and letting Christ live through us. And I've said about that, but that's, that's my approach, and it's very, very different than most people that when they teach the, the tabernacle and the things of the Old Testament and try to show us Christ in those things. All right, let's go to the book of Hebrews, and of course, most of you will know that the book of Hebrews is just jam-packed, full of of showing that all of these things, everything from the priesthood to the tabernacle to the offerings to everything that they did was a shadow and that Christ is the fulfillment and that the shadow's done away when you've got the real. Okay? Hebrews chapter, did I tell you chapter 8? Hebrews 8, and let's look at um, verse 5. Well, maybe we ought to... Let's start at verse 3. Hebrews 8, 3. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. And these, these priests that offer according to the law serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount. All right, so here he is literally including everything in that tabernacle. And he's saying that that is all a shadow or a picture or a reflection of Christ, but it is not Christ. And the true 
the true fulfillment of those things is seen by the life of Christ. So that every sacrifice is performed by the life of Christ through his body. And every object that's in that tabernacle is nothing but a shadow, but we are not a shadow. And he is not a shadow. And those things are being worked in and through us as reality. <clears throat> All right. And then finally, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. This will be our last scripture on this. <clears throat> For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things. Okay, so here you have the shadow Hebrews 10 1 for the law all right now again the law is everything from offerings to to thou shalt not steal thou shalt not kill that's Old Testament law that's not what we're what we're functioning by we're functioning by you know I remember when I was in Bible school and the Lord spoke that to me he said to the Old Testament people here's the way the law read thou shalt not steal thou shalt not kill Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet. Old Testament. That's how the law read. To the new covenant people who have the life and fulfillment of it that Christ can do those things in us, it says, Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. You go, really? I won't? Yeah, by Christ you won't. Don't worry about it. You know? You mean I don't have to really work hard to not do those things? No, you got the nature of it. Trust me, you'll, you'll live it. Thou shalt not covet. But it's all depending on the object, which is Christ. Can I get an amen? If we don't have the object, we're just trying to do that by shadows or by law or by rule. There's nothing wrong with rules, but let me tell you, there, it's better to have a nature that fulfills rules than a nature that is against rules. You know, Christ in you, the hope of glory. All right, so, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image because the shadow is not the very image of it. It is just a vague reflection. And not the very image of the things can never, with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually, make those who come to it perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers once purged should have had no more consciousness of sin. All right. Now, interestingly enough, and I don't want to get too far in this, but I want to help you see this thing a little more by the grace of God and the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit to open our eyes and hearts to see these things, not my ability to explain it. The sin offerings have ceased. Burn offerings have not ceased. Now, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody say that, but if you'll read this, when it talks about the sin offering, it's done and it's settled and it's over. What does that mean? Well, that means in the Old Covenant, if you sinned, you had to go get a lamb and go kill that lamb and then, got, and then burn it up and then God would ex accept the, the death of the lamb in the place of what you did. And if you turned around two hours later and sinned again, you'd have to go get another lamb. And some of you people, you wouldn't have flocks big enough for your lives. Because <laughs> every time you messed up, you'd have to go get a lamb and go kill it. And after a while, you're going, gee whiz, we used to have a thousand sheep. Now we got three, you know. Yeah. <laughs> And then you say, well, honey, stop it. No. <laughs> but, but, this, but the scriptures declare 
that this lamb died once and for all and you don't have to treat your sin as if you got to go back reoffer a lamb oh i'm sorry jesus for putting you through this again you not he ain't dying again <laughs> every time you sin you don't go up to the throne room fall before jesus rake him off the throne pull him into an altar throw him down and kill it there father accept that no he did it once for all and it's settled and and your sins are not a problem your relation to him is where the problem is now what does that mean your relation you know everybody always says your relation is him needs to be Mended. Well, no, your understanding of your relationship needs to be amended. You're one. He, ha he is your life. He can overcome those things. You can't. Yes, he died for you, your sin. Yes, all sin is already dealt with. Anybody that ever sins is all dealt with on the cross, settled forever. As far as God is concerned, as far as Jesus is concerned, they're not up there going, Oh my God, somebody sinned. Did you see that? First of all, if it showed up on a screen, it would the, just the screen would go black with all the sin that happens on this earth. You know. If God did that, he would go, Oh myself. Oh, oh my God! On yeah. oh, myself, a bunch of people sin. Look, look, and he'd look over at Jesus and go, "That's cool. I died for that." Oh yeah. No, no, the Father knows better. But I'm just saying, if the, you know, if heaven is not shook, heaven is settled. If you understand what I mean, the problem lies. Our, our lack of union or walking in union, not lack of union, but lack of walking in that union where thou shalt not steal. If it's Christ, you'll find yourself going, I don't, I don't want to do it. God will provide for me. You know, God is my father. He loves me. He's looking out for me. I don't have to go do those things. And a freedom comes. And it's, and it's beautiful. But notice I said that while the sin offering ceased, the, the uh, burn offerings didn't. Why? Because burn offerings weren't under the law. They were included in the sacrifices and stuff. But all the offerings that you see before Moses were all burn offerings. Before, and before Moses, there was no law. Burnt offerings were a regular part of those who really loved God. But they weren't just trying to get God to forgive them of their sin because burnt offering is a whole different category. Burnt offering is somebody that is in relationship with him to such a degree that that very nature is the burnt offering happening in them, Christ in you, the burnt offering of God, which you can't stop that offering. You can't end that. You can't make that offering cease because that offering is a person in his selfless, self-giving nature. Does that make sense? That, 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 how can that cease? This ceases. Those, those certain shadows cease. But there are others that he fulfilled that he continues to fulfill because he is not just the fulfiller but the fulfillment of those things. And they're still happening in his body. Okay? It's a big deal. It's a big deal. All right. However, the shadow of those burnt offering, not the sin offering, but the burnt offering, <coughs> the shadow of it ceased. The shadow of it ceased. Even with Israel. 
you know, they don't, they don't offer, you know, on Passover, they don't kill a lamb to this day. They don't, they haven't for thousands of years. They don't kill a lamb. Do you know that? They put an egg and a bone down there. And some, and, you know, it, it's ridiculous. But nonetheless, that's, you know, that's their modern day picture of the Passover, which is a far cry from even the shadow. I mean, it's even left the shadow, you know. This pictures Christ, he, so he gives a, 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 a burnt offering, a dead lamb. And he would look at the modern day pa Passover and say, this does not picture Christ. You know, but that's neither here nor there, and I'm not trying to put anybody down or any whatever, it's just a fact. I mean, I was shocked that that is the way that it is. <clears throat> All right. So here he's, he says, when he's dealing with sin offerings and offerings for sin, he's, he says that they cease. Because, gosh, I really would like to explain this more, and I could easily do it. But I'm starting to drift a little from my subject. But I think it was it's important that you realize that so much that Christians are trying to do is fulfilled by Christ and and or will be fulfilled by Christ in you. Is that okay? Can I depart there a little bit? <clears throat> All right. I need to get the science of shadows thing settled here. Um, so I, I wrote a few little things here. The Old Testament is a shadow of the truth. Okay, the Old Testament is not a shadow of the New Testament. The Old Testament is a shadow of Christ. The book of Hebrews is not a contrast of Christianity and Judaism. It's a contrast of shadows to the real. All right, so now the science of it. When or how are shadows formed? How are shadows formed? Very important. Shadows are formed when light is blocked. Right? With that flashlight that he gave me, when I shine it on my hand, it is blocking the light. And when it blocks the light, you see a shadow. Right? You need to follow this if you're going to get the science of it because I am about to show you a different reality than what most people think based on the science of shadows. Here's the question then. If shadows are formed when light is blocked, then here's the question. Who blocked the light? Was it God? Was it the devil? Oh, that is the best answer you could have given right there. I said, who blocked the light? Was it God or the devil? And she said it was the object. <laughs> Excellent answer. All right. Here, here's the next thing. God made the light, but most Christians live in shadows. Right? But God made the light. But Satan didn't block the light. We're going to say it like this. You're, that's the best answer the object get. We're going to say it like this for now till we can get into the till we can walk into it specifically. Satan didn't block the light. God did. How are shadows cast and what form do they take? They a shadow takes the form of the shape of the thing that blocks the light. Everybody agree with that? Just the science of shadows. The shadow takes the form of the thing that's blocking the light. Right. Right. But the most important thing of that, that statement is that the shadow is taking the form of the light blocker. Okay. 
but they are shadows of Jesus. And they are not the real, meaning they're not actually him, they're only shadows. If astrophysics is correct, then Jesus himself is blocking the light. If electromagnetic radiation is correct, then the shadow is proving, according to what we've read here, is proving Jesus is the light blocker. If it's correct. All right? The shadows we see and live in are made by him and are of him. Now, we, we've understood they are of him. We've all biblically, without any understanding of, of science, said the shadow is of him because he's the object, right? But have we truly understood that they are made by him? That the shadows are actually made by him? All right. Uh, he did. He, but he did not make them, but casts them, depending on the direction of the light. <laughs> See. Something has to readjust in our mind there, doesn't it? Doesn't something have to turn different than what we've always said with shadows? Because the science of shadows proves that Jesus is blocking the light. Jesus is casting the shadow, but he's not really blocking the light. It's all based on the direction of the light and how the light is approached concerning him. When it is directed toward us, Jesus casts shadows. Absolutely, absolutely. So when it is directed toward us, the light, Jesus casts a shadow. When it is directed toward him, he is brilliantly seen. All right. We're trying to get light on a subject. We're trying to get something from God. We're trying to come to an understanding. We're trying to see, you know, exactly what Kim said is correct. The state of your heart makes all the difference in the world. When your heart turns to the Lord, you see Him. When your heart doesn't turn to the Lord yet, you see shadows of Him. It looks like Him. It's formed out from Him. It is a reflection of Him, but it is not Him. Yes. Amen. <clears throat> you have to look away from the object and look at the earth where the shadow hits. And this is exactly what Bible scholars who study the tabernacle are doing. They are turning their eyes to the shadow to understand the real. Now, how in, that, how in the world... I mean, yeah, you can come up with a basic form. You know, I mean, I notice my, my hand, I've got a little uh, thing. I just went to the skin doctor, and, and uh, he hit me with a little thing a couple of places. Actually, it looks like my wife beat me up. But, but I showed him this little thing, and he said, that's not a wart. That's a da-da-da-da-da-da. And I said, uh, well, you know, you're a skin doctor. Can you get rid of it? And he said, well, yeah, but it, it won't hurt anything. It's not a problem. Anyway, when I had the light up, I noticed that it was showing up in my shadow, which someone who knows me closely would say, that was Randy's hand. 
But you only know that if you really know Randy. Or you could study the shadow and go, now if this is Randy, if this is Jesus, if this is, you know, and he has, not a wart, but whatever that guy called that thing, he has one of those things. And his hand is, basically, he's got long fingers for playing guitar, and he's got da-da-da-da, and, you know, and this is what he's like. You never met him. You only studied the shadow. All your information is based on what somebody else told you or what you saw through the shadow or from da 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 and all that kind of junk. Don't know. Let me tell you. Let me just make this clear right now. Don't listen to me. Don't. Don't believe anything I tell you. Go to the scriptures and look it up and check it out. Because I could be telling you wrong. I I can tell you from the bottom of my heart, I don't want to tell you wrong. But in almost 40 years of teaching the word of God, do you believe I've ever looked back and went, Oh, I remember when I taught that and that was wrong. Do you think that ever happened? Some of you have been around about that long. You know, you've been around a long time. I probably said junk wrong. Don't listen to me. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Go to the Word of God. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you if that's true or not. Hear from the Lord. There are deceivers out there, and there are people who are not trying to deceive who don't know everything. Me. I'm I'm not trying to deceive anybody. But I don't know everything. So I encourage you, don't look at the shadows of what someone teaches. If they've seen Jesus, then you say, Father, I remember I used to be so jealous when I'd hear somebody that really had heard heard from the Holy Spirit and seen Christ. I would just go, I want to know you like that. And that jealousy actually worked for me because it drove me to the Word. And I said, I want to know you. I don't want to just hear it from them. I want to know you. So, anyway, let me try to finish this off. Um, If you, if you read, gosh, I wish I had these scriptures down. It's just coming to me right now. If you read the book of Genesis, the first couple of chapters, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and God said, let there be light. Okay. On a strictly science basis, on a strictly creation basis, That's pretty cool. But there's questions mixed in with that, isn't there? What's without form and void? And what is God starting with light and then creation as if there was some other chaotic, because the word without form and void literally denotes chaos. What's up with that? You know? And, you know, and here we go. On our, I'm talking science now. Well, you know, so what was before, you know, and it, you, know, it, you know, all of this stuff. All right. But then you get into, and if I, if I remember correctly, it's the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah brings up that scripture, and he starts talking about inward realities of your heart. And he relates it totally outside of creation and relates it on a personal basis as if the creation story really isn't as important as the new creation story, that God's at work in you forming your chaos, bringing forth light and life, and you know, life running crazy on a million fronts, but it's Christ in you. And then... You, you know, you go all the way to, um, what is it, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. 
For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and God and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep, and God said, Let there be light. Shining out of darkness. It's as if the light isn't shining into the darkness, exposing the darkness, but shining out of it. It's as if he didn't fix all the darkness. He let it become a partaker of light, and from that, all the other darkness sees this light shining out of it. That's Christ. That's not me. That's not you. None of us are good enough. All have sinned. All have fallen short. Nobody's perfect. Oh, I'm sorry, one, Jesus. But not just the Jesus of 2,000 years ago that's walking around with robes and sandals and long hair and a beard. That's good that that guy was perfect. That doesn't help me today unless that same guy's sitting on a throne looking at me going, shape up and be as good as I was. I, I can't handle that. Do you understand what I mean when I say I can't handle that? I can't be you. I'm the darkness, and when you shine into my darkness, I just look bad. <laughs> and I feel bad. Yes. Right, absolutely. Why are you looking at something with your eyes? It's emptiness and voidness. Like you're a black hole empty and void of Christ. And when we're filled with the object, light has come because light is filled with your heart. We see to be filled, not because we've got something in our brain and knowledge, but we're filled. So we see because the object is no longer shadow, it's a reality. Well, you know, you can go right into the, the, you know, the science of light then, and you get into the different spectrums, and you get into, you know, animals that see with a heat signature, and they don't see the thing. They see the heat signature in it. They see the warmth of where the heart is and, you know, the bot and like that. And then you see other, other things that can, you know, I was watching something on the PBS the other night, and they said that it, they discovered that elephants are communicating beyond the human ear and they've been recording everything you know for years this lady is great she lived with these element elephants for 20 years and recording everything and watching their movements and stuff and about two or three years ago um, another lady in the states was at the zoo and something she was an older lady and some by deep vibration something was bugging her ear and she's watching this elephant, and she studied elephants, and she went, I wonder if they, they speak beyond what we can hear. So they took a thing that could record deeper and beyond our spectrum of hearing. Sure enough, they have a full language going on more than what's in the realm of what we can hear. She said, I spent 20 years listening to this little thing, and there's this whole you know, deal that I didn't even know. Well, <clears throat> I was just thinking of, of light, actually, and, and anybody correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think I'm right. Actual, what we call visible light or it is all the colors together that makes what we call light. It is all the colors, all of them, okay? And that's visible, or that's what we call visible light, but the truth is, it's not visible to us, but that light is all of the colors. It's not just heat seeking or it's not just, you know, on some other level. It is all of them. The problem isn't with the light. The problem is with our ability to perceive beyond our little realm of that spectrum. Does that make sense? I mean, I'm just talking scientifically now. 
But God made that light, that light to actually be the fulfillment of all of it if you could just know it. You could see like an owl or see like a hawk or see like a human. You could see underwater or, you know, all of those things. And they're all there within that spectrum but we've reduced it just our seeing is in one realm visible light our hearing is only on one level we can't hear below or above and there might be I mean we walk out I mean just think just think like if you were in Africa and you could hear the lowest of low that elephants and the highest of high from birds and what if you walked out of the forest and it was just like <laughs> I mean, just so much stuff going on. You're like, golly, I thought I heard a few monkeys and a few birds, but my God, this, it's a lie. They're communicating. There's a whole world going on out here, you know. But we just go, well, I'm man. I understand everything. You're fallen man. You're not man as God wanted you to be. Christ is man as God wanted you to be, and you're joined to the man, Jesus Christ. That's your hope. That's your hope of seeing beyond human spectrum. That's your hope of hearing beyond what makes sense to you. Amen. And my God, there's so much beyond what makes sense to me. Well, that can't be right. Well, it might be. You know, yes. <laughs> The biggest problem is this. We are already in trouble when the light is coming to our direction and we're trying to understand it and whatever light we have, we're laying hold of it. That's shadow light. Until it's pointed at Christ, it doesn't matter how much we know. You know. Uh, someone, some little old lady often Seattle, who lives in a little house that can barely live off of her social security, may have more Jesus in her thumb than all of us in this place put together. And she may never heard the phrase, you know, Christ in you or something, you know? She just lives it. And we make so much more out of the... the theology of it and the terminology which is worse I mean you know I mean at least the theology has some ground in it but the terminology becomes God to us and that's even worse and I'll just end with this you're going to run into people that don't say it like we do they may have more Jesus than you do don't don't listen and go well that ain't right because they said it in a different way. You know, listen. Listen to them. I mean, not really listen because I have. I made mistakes for years, and then one time somebody started talking, and, of course, my self-righteous self went, well, that ain't right. And the Holy Spirit said, just listen to what they're saying. So I said, you know, because I know that voice. Okay. So I started listening. And I went, you know what? They're really saying what I was saying. I'm sitting there refuting them, and they're saying what I was saying, but it's the way that they're saying it. It's just a different way of saying it, but they, they're they really meaning the same thing. And I went, that's right. That's really good. And we got the fellowship and stuff, and it was really good. And from that point on, I determined I am not going to be so critical of people that don't speak, Randy speak, you know. God. And, and if you think that I'm, I know anything, I know nothing yet as I ought. So let's keep our hearts towards the Lord and let's, let's, let's keep the, the focus of the light not from heaven to us because that casts shadows but pointed towards Christ so that we find the object. Let's pray. Father, we just ask you to do what we cannot do to make serious what we cannot make serious because we don't even know how serious it is. We ask you to bring forth
the full reality of the Son by showing us the object himself and that we go on to not just be imprinted in our minds but imprinted in our lifestyle so that it is Christ and not a shadow of him. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.